Is, is this on? Do you hear me? Yeah? Nice. Cool. So welcome. Thanks for sticking around. Uh, this is 3DF, uh, a system called 3DF, a reactive data log engine for Datomic, or really for anyone who thinks that graphs and relations are cool and that logic uh, is a nice thing to have when interacting with them. So Rich Hickey, in one of his early talks on Datomic, I think everyone knows who Rich Hickey is, uh, and he said, we want to make reactive systems that don't poll, so that don't, uh, that don't have to ask repeatedly for new information about the world. And we want those systems to get a consistent view of the world. So if they get multiple answers, they should be as of a logical point in time. And of course, if you uh, plan to speak uh, to a closure audience and Rich Hickey gives you a quote like that, uh, that's really cool. I can defer to his authority. Uh, so this is exactly what we're planning to do. And uh, so I'm Nico. Uh, I work at a software consultancy that I co-founded with some of these guys here that's called Clockworks. Um, we specialize in these kind of things. Uh, and I'm also a graduate student at ETH in Zurich, uh, where uh, this kind of originated uh, in, in research uh, by my advisor there, who's called Frank McSherry, who has invented like most of the cool principles of differential data flow uh, back uh, at Microsoft Research. And so this is an ongoing collaboration, and I'm very happy uh, to share it today. So reactive systems, again, I kind of never want to get into a position where I have to define what reactive means. I just want to give like uh, instances of the thing so you know what we're talking about. And I think everyone uh, thinks of spreadsheets. We have real-time dashboards. We have stocks. We have web apps that kind of update in real time. We have these kind of workflow systems that were talked about before. Uh, we have rule engines, um, anything that gives us alerts when things happen. We have collaborative tools like users chatting in a web app or users editing uh, documents. Or anything really that kind of works like a stream processor where data, unbounded amounts of data kind of stream in over time. And there's never really a finish point. Um, there's only ongoing computation. And I kind of want to extract from that uh, some principles. There is no, like, uh, I don't claim that these are a complete set of principles. It's just to get into the mindset. So I think one of the most important properties is that data coordinates code. We're kind of used to having code that reaches around and moves data all over the place. But instead, we want to turn this around and have code be coordinated by data. We want systems that only propagate change, so we don't want to send around big results all of the time if nothing really changed. We only want to send uh, the small pieces that actually have some novelty. And we want things uh, like a relationship, a computational relationship that is established. We want that to be maintained as new data streams in. Uh, so constraints, for example, is an interesting uh, example of that. We never want the constraint uh, to, be, uh, to be violated, even if the underlying data changes. And of course, if we build any kind of big system, we want uh, any kind of results that we're looking at, we want them, first of all, of course, to be correct, but also we want them to kind of uh, reflect the current state of our domain, the current state of our business. Uh, we don't want to see results from uh, weeks ago. Of course, uh, the image that probably most of you have in mind is a spreadsheet. Uh, a spreadsheet um, fits the bill for most of these. Like We have uh, values, computations always reflect uh, the current state uh, of the domain, and obviously a relationship, a computational relationship that is once established will be maintained if you update these little things. But uh, I guess you didn't expect this. And also disclaimers, I, I don't know anything about pottery, which might show now, but uh, it, to my mind at least, a potter's wheel seems like a very nice uh, reactive system that maintains a symmetry constraint as you use it. And so I kind of like this image of systems that are kind of tactile and respond in a natural way uh, and um, maintain a certain set of constraints for us. Okay, so enough of this philosophical nonsense. Uh, back to this principle, data coordinates code, not the other way around. Um, that is really what I want to focus on. In a world where that is the case, we kind of shift our language a bit. Instead of talking about evaluating a query on a database, we want to talk more about subscribing to a query uh, to a database and the database updating us with new information. And instead of recomputing big, complex, big data things uh, from scratch all the time, we want to talk more about incrementally updating the results that we already have uh, to fit whatever novelty uh, happened to our system. Uh, and I want to show you quickly what this could look like in practice. Can you see this font size-wise? So what I'm going to do now, without probably any of you uh, knowing actually the, the system behind this, just trust me on this one, I'm going to start a magical server. Uh, and I'm going to 
load the Datomic in-memory database. And I have this simple schema where I'm talking about devices. Devices have names that identify them. Devices have speeds associated with them that are reported, for example, through a sensor that is connected to some uh, IoT network. And we have a database with uh, settings for these devices, indicating the speeds at which they're supposed to run. Uh, and so uh, we start a service that will read from this atomic database and forward it into this magical 3DF system that you don't know yet about. Um, and we will connect to 3DF so that we can subscribe to queries. So first of all, uh, this is just a regular datomic uh, transaction. We want to transact the schema that I just described such that it becomes available in our database. And we want to start with some initial data where we say, okay, we have two devices. One is dev0, one is dev1. Uh, and both are supposed to run, dev1 is, uh, dev0 is supposed to run at a speed of 100, and dev1 is supposed to run at a speed of 130. So we transact these settings into the database. Now, we issue a query now uh, that looks a lot like a, a datomic query. So this part here is the interesting one. This is data log, or at least like the datomic flavored um, data log that many of you might have seen in presentations uh, on datomic. And what it says, it's just we're interested in all of the current speed readings um, for all of these devices. And obviously, there are no speed readings yet. We have only transacted settings. So as we subscribe, there is no interesting information. We don't get any results. Next, we uh, subscribe a similar query, which is interested in the current settings for these devices. And of course, now uh, we receive an output uh, that looks a lot like what Datomic might send you. But instead, uh, it is for a query um, that is called current settings. And it also indicates some additional information for the result tuple. So we know, OK, dev0 uh, is supposed to run at a speed of 100. Dev1 is supposed to run at a speed of 130. And uh, both of these uh, results were, happened at the, uh, were computed at a consistent time, uh, consistent logical time, uh, the timestamp 1003, which corresponds to Datomic's internal transaction ID. And we get another weird number, which is this one here, indicating the multiplicity of these results. So it says like we have one of these results each. This might seem weird and redundant right now, but it will become clear in a second. So now um, we want to describe another query, which is interested in all of the, all the devices that are running below the speed that they're supposed to be running at. So for that, we use basically the same query, but with this small predicate. And there's obviously no devices yet uh, running at any speed. And whenever we have such a device, we reuse this query that we just defined, the deviating query. Uh, we extract some of the information about these devices, like the name and the actual values. Uh, we compute the actual devi uh, deviation, and we want to alert on that. Maybe we want to send an email, or we just want to print it to the REPL for now. OK, so now novelty happens in the system. So the device 0 uh, reports its first speed. Uh, the speed is 87 in this uh, unitless system. And now what interesting, uh, the interesting thing that happens is we receive results for queries that we've issued uh, before. So we don't have to go back and uh, reevaluate these queries. Instead, the database updates us and tells us, hey, OK, so now I have a, a result for the current speed query, which is that device 0 is running at 87. And as you see, this is as of the logical transaction 1004, which means we have progressed one transaction into the future. Uh, also, we get a result at, um, on the deviating query because device zero is now running below configuration. So we get the ID of this device uh, and the corresponding alert, which says, oh, OK, so device zero, it's called device zero, and it has a deviation of 13 from its, um, uh, from its target speed. Now device one uh, reports its speed. So it will be running at speed 120, and again, uh, we get results here for all of the previous uh, queries, but you see that only change propagates. So we don't get the full result set of the speeds for device zero and device one. We only get the additions that happen. So we only get device one is now running at 120. That doesn't invalidate anything we know about device zero yet. And also device one is deviating. So now as device one is speeding up, the speed increases and it reaches its target velocity. Once that happens, we receive results with a multiplicity of minus one, indicating that the previous results are no longer valid because device one, first of all, is not running at speed 120 anymore. 
it's instead running at speed 130. This, in turn, means it's running at the configured speed, which means that it's not deviating anymore. So also the deviating result is retracted. Uh, and finally, the corresponding alert uh, does also have to, has to be retracted. So this is what these multiplicities are for. It means that we can only communicate what happened both in the additive sense and also in the retractive sense. OK. Uh, and now uh, there might be another source of change, which is an administrator uh, logging into the management console and changing the configuration settings. So we say, instead of uh, running at 130, we want device 1 to run at speed 150. So once that happens, again, uh, we get a retraction on the speed of 130, uh, on the settings of 130. Instead, we get the new settings of 150. And now, device 1 has to be considered deviating again because it has not yet caught up to its new settings. So I hope this is enough to kind of see um, the way we imagine this to work. And you see here's this server running happily along, uh, connecting Datomic to this yet to be explained uh, system. So uh, what's been powering this in the backend is a system uh, that we've been developing uh, for uh, both at EGH and at Clockworks now for the better part of a year, actually pretty much a year right now. It's called 3DF. It's on GitHub. Uh, and what it does is pretty simple. It pr uh, provides reactive data log queries in the sense that I just showed. Uh, it sits on top of your existing databases, preferably databases that um, kind of speak in this language of additions and retractions and facts, uh, such as Datomic, but there's also alter alternatives out there. Uh, uh, the Data Hike project, where I think some people involved with that are also sitting here, and of course, things like Kafka. Uh, and the interesting thing about uh, 3DF, it's is built on this magical differential data flow technology uh, that uh, is so, sounds so ominous, um, and I also don't fully understand yet, but uh, it uh, gives a nice um, operational properties, such as the system is lean enough to run in a browser, like we have WebAssembly builds, for example, but it scales to proper big data setups with uh, uh, clusters of, of many machines uh, to handle all your supersized workloads. Right, so I want to hammer this home. So this is not a database. Instead, uh, this is intended to run on top of an existing database. So we have a source of truth or several sources of truth uh, that all provide a transaction log of novelty that happened in the system. So every transaction gets written to that. And 3DF, in whatever configuration it's running, will read from this transaction log. Uh, and this won't change anything for clients for now. Clients just transact data as they were before. But instead, they gain the capability now uh, to send data log queries to this 3DF cluster. Uh, which um, means that this query will then be registered, and all of these clients that are interested in new results will be updated uh, as new transactions stream in. Right. So back off a bit. The goal here is kind of to make reactive, whatever that means, to make these kinds of systems practical and easy. And I kind of want to um, identify four requirements for that. The first one, as I said, we kind of want to work like a spreadsheet. So data coordinates code. But uh, we don't want to get into a situation where we have like a Kafka with lots of data streaming in, and we have to write like complex temporal joins uh, by hand all the time, aggregate stuff all the time, filter stuff all the time. So it kind of has to be declarative, or it should be declarative in the sense that Datomic uh, is declarative, or SQL is declarative. Um, and the second set of requirements is kind of we don't want to think about the different ways in which a query like the one I showed you uh, can change. So it should be transparent. We don't want to change the way that we write um, our data log queries. But still, of course, uh, we want this to be efficient. So we don't want to recompute from scratch every time a new transaction comes in, because as the number of uh, queries that are registered grows, uh, this becomes impractical pretty fast. And as you as closure programmers, I guess, are all familiar with, uh, we usually compute with snapshots. So we have a database collection at a timestamp T0. And we apply a function to that. In this case, the function is the evaluation of a query. And it produces a result collection at this same logical timestamp t0. This is all very easy, all very straightforward. This corresponds kind of to this uh, data log query similar to the ones I've shown you, uh, which simply describe a world, in, uh, a world of devices with the speeds and with target speeds uh, and in which all of these devices are deviating from their target. So this is very transparent. We don't have to think about change because we don't consider change at all. Uh, and it's very declarative. So we're not specifying how to join things together. Contrast this um, with this differential, with this incremental way of uh, computing, 
Uh, there we have a kind of a modified version of the function that we just used, this delta query. We still have a database collection at timestamp t0, but now we're looking at changes at uh, timestamp t1, uh, which intend to bring the database from t0 to t1. We look at this set of changes, which usually uh, is much smaller than the existing database, uh, and we want to compute a corresponding set of differences, the delta results at timestamp 1, such that if we apply these delta results to the old results uh, that we computed before, we will arrive at the corresponding result set for time uh, t1. So instead of throwing away all of this huge uh, information that we computed in the previous queries, we simply update them to match uh, the new data. Um, this kind of corresponds to a query like this, which uh, you can write uh, in Datomic, uh, which makes it explicit that we're not only talking about a database, this is the dollar symbol here, but we're also talking about a transaction that is uh, just happening at a logical point in time. And we make it explicit that we want to join devices that are in the database uh, with the transaction that just happened. If we make this, uh, if we are a bit careful with this, we can uh, make this so that we get the same uh, performance characteristics that we would expect from an incremental approach because we only have to look at the small uh, transaction and not at the big database. Uh, uh, but still, here we break uh, the, uh, the transparency um, uh, property because now we have to write different queries depending on the sources of change for this query. So in this case, this query will only cover changes uh, to the device speed but not changes to the setting speed. And this compounds as we start deriving more results from these queries because then we kind of have to, yeah, it, everything becomes uh, threefold. We have to, for every source of change, we have to write a new query. For the initial results, we have to write a query and uh, derive from those. So we kind of want both. And uh, this is where differential data flow comes in. So differential data flow is not a closure project. It's a Rust um, system. It's a distributed stream processor. Uh, and it provides you a data parallel programming framework designed to quickly respond to arbitrary changes in input. And now, uh, I will not uh, do this system justice in the time that I have left, and I kind of want to focus today more on a conceptual, like where this fits in a bigger context. Um, we have some in more information on this out, and I also I gave a talk at last year's uh, Closure Conch, where I dive a bit deeper into um, how differential data flow provides um, what I've just shown you. But I kind of want to give a very quick intuition designed for closure programmers. Differential data flow is a system that at heart is also concerned with immutable time varying collections. So this is very natural to the way we model data in Datomic. We consider additions and retractions at various logical times that uh, when looked at at a specific point in time uh, will accumulate to the current view of the collection. So uh, here we add two edges and we retract one and uh, we add another one. So at various points in time, we have different views uh, of this set. In differential data flow, uh, and I'm sorry, I don't have the time to go into this. It's, uh, it, it annoys a bit. It annoys me a bit. But um, so in, in differential, the first difference is that uh, collections don't have to vary, uh, vary along a single dimension of time. So they can vary along multiple dimensions of time, which is used to implement um, all of these uh, data log recursive looping iterative operations uh, on a distributed system. Uh, and uh, the second difference kind of is that whereas in Clojure, we always fold um, the, the differences that we apply back into an overarching collection. In differential, we never leave this world of differences. So as you might know, uh, Clojure collections are usually uh, implemented as trees. Uh, and so it kind of fits this uh, incremental workflow quite a bit. If we uh, apply, uh, if we conch something onto an existing collection, we will get a new spine for this tree. But in closure, we always consider then the snapshot view of this collection uh, before we apply more operations. In differential, uh, all operators are built to only ever work with these differences, which kind of uh, leads to a system that, um, yeah, well, end to end works just with differences. And I, please, I have to defer you to the, to the conch talk to get more into this. OK, so um, Reactive made practical. I think uh, we have uh, covered now how data coordinates code, that this is declarative, that we write data log without thinking about change, and that queries update incrementally, and only change is propagated. And the bigger context in which I want to put this in the last five minutes uh, is that kind of 
the more we think about it, everybody who wants to do something with data eventually wants to be like a database peer, because that is where all the fun is, that is where all the data is. Uh, everything is at hand, you don't have to worry about round trips. This is one of the fu fundamental design principles behind, uh, behind Datomic itself. And so if you consider a big graph of data, all your data in your system that is changing uh, frequently, we kind of want this. We want peers that have a view on this graph, a view on the subset of this, on subsets of this graph, but they don't want copies. They want live views. They want views that get updated as the system changes. And there are various ways uh, to achieve this, and I don't want to make a value judgment about, about any of them. I just want to present them as is next to each other. So, the, um, oh, sure, these peers correspond to various applications like web UIs, alerting systems, uh, analytical systems. And the Datomic approach to this was we broadcast all novelty to all peers, and every peer can decide for himself, like, what are the things that I need to keep in cache and what are the things that I can uh, ignore. The IONS, the Atomic IONS, the, the newer cloud year version of uh, Datomic, kind of um, takes an opposite approach, instead moves all of the consumers into the database where you don't have to worry about this because everyone is sitting in the same process. And this, these are both very valid approaches for various use cases, but I kind of want to raise these additional points, which are how do we deal with multiple data sources, how do we only send relevant novelty to peers, so not all novelty to everyone, especially considering that most of our clients these days are actually on browsers um, or on, on desktop PCs. Uh, and what do we do if we want to integrate with uh, runtimes that cannot be moved into the datomic process, for example? So what if we want to integrate with machine learning models in Python or whatever? And yes, and so the uh, alternative that 3DF provides is kind of a declarative replication approach via data log, which means that um, this whole uh, set of all data is successively filtered down by more and more detailed data log queries into just the set of data that is accessible to a peer that the peer is interested in, and he will receive only the novelty that he's interested in. Uh, and this kind of uh, means we're open to anyone who speaks data log, so we we're not forced onto a single specific runtime. Uh, we will only co uh, communicate what is necessary, and we can scale to deal, because this is a distributed system, we can scale to deal uh, with uh, more than one data source. To finish this off, we want to make reactive systems that don't pull, and we want the systems to get a consistent view of the world. I think that's great. I think that's true. Uh, and uh, if you think so too, then 3DF uh, gives you a nice way to leverage data log, uh, so a declarative way to build such reactive systems. Uh, it allows you to treat more of your data consumers as true database peers. It allows you to scale your queries beyond the limits of a single peer. So where you were before maybe reaching to something like Spark, you now get to uh, stay within this nice world of data log. And it allows you for the, the most special purpose of computations to integrate with handwritten uh, differential data flows. And so if this seems interesting to you, uh, I'm happy to talk. And if you want to ask me more about how differential data flow actually works, please also do so. And I will explain at length. Um, and thank you very much. That was very, very insightful. Interestingly, the person I mentioned who always talks about differential data flow is also the Frank, Frank McSherry. Frank uh, yeah, that's, yeah. that's my uh, so that was um, an interesting uh, coincidence, I guess. Um, OK, I expect there to be many questions. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I think we have time for a few questions. Uh, so if anybody has a question, um, now would be the time to raise your hand. There we go. First brave person. <laughs> uh, so, in uh, uh, if I remember correctly, uh, in the Datomic, there are certain things you, that uh, are not as easy to do. For instance, uh, querying by sort and things like that. Yes. Uh, does this system uh, support anything like that, or is it a good fit because it also doesn't, or something like right. that? Right. So, uh, sorting is is very interesting because uh, sorting in basically messes with any kind of relational system in the sense that. Um, if you want to do a sorting operation, you always have to look at all data. So there's no interesting way of filtering down. We can, like, so we want to focus on providing things like um, powerful joins and powerful aggregations because that is something where we can provide value. And if you think about it in this differential setting, sorting is even more of a pain because uh, if, you, um, if, you, uh, if the order is part of your result, basically, then any 
single change in the actual data uh, will lead to uh, massive changes in the output because all of the previous uh, results have to be reordered. So usually in this set setting, we think more in terms of like a top K operator, like, a, like a, the give me the top number of uh, things, so let's say the top 100 by some uh, aggregate. And in that case, we can uh, let differential handle the, aggreg uh, the aggregating part and giving you just the top 100 things and let you sort them yourself because 100 things, everyone can sort them. Uh, and just make sure that it gives you like the top version and don't care about ordering of the actual results. So it's still definitely a, a pain point in a sense, but kind of an inherent one more of a thing. Thank you. Uh, there we go, we have one more. So is the system also available for closure script? So it could be like used for building rich clients like for web applications? Yes, so actually I, I cut this because I noticed I have <laughs> so little time. <laughs> uh, but uh, the, um, the, the client that I shown you, this closure 3 df project, basically that is um, cross, uh, cross platform if you want, across <laughs> cross closure. Uh, so it runs, uh, it runs from, from closure script and we have like um, plans for integrating this nicely with React kind of uh, UI approaches. It has some benefits there. Uh, but also the, the interesting thing is you can have this compiled down to WebAssembly and run it entirely within a browser. So for example, where you now are maybe using something like DataScript uh, and uh, Redux or whatever to get this kind of uh, reactive um, data flow, uh, you could also use something like that and use reactive data log queries entirely on the front end. So definitely the cross-platform aspect is uh, big for us. Thank you. Uh, more questions? Okay, then I, I have one. Yes. Um, so it seems you work with, with some researchers as well in this, and it seems like part of this work is also research work in a way. Yes. Um, but it also seems that this is like some, there's some commercial side. So I was just wondering if you could tell us a bit about uh, like how, if you've deployed this somewhere, what kind of problems you've used it on, what, what kind of customers right. or, you know, like just give a right. bit of context so, on, on that. So the, the um, commercial use case for this is basically uh, not so much in the, like we're, we're not competing with databases or anything like that. It's more of from, uh, you have companies that want to become more data driven, like I guess many of you know, uh, and where we have the kind of uh, settings that I think the, two talks previous about like using Kafka to kind of untangle this mess of data producers, data consumers. Uh, and this kind of gets you one step uh, of the way. And I think there are many more steps to go beyond that in terms of how easy is access to data. Uh, do we have to think about um, these kind of tricky temporal joints? I think they even mentioned it explicitly in terms of uh, it's hard to uh, merge um, many events in a transactionally consistent event over time as you have settings in a database, events streaming in. And this is something where differential absolutely shines. And so we are intend, interested in kind of working with uh, customers to build layers on top of that, uh, to build systems for data analytics, and also especially for feeding analytics back into products. Uh, but that is less uh, interesting from the, from the research point of view. Like the, the original research on differential data flow kind of is going into uh, different um, uh, directions now. So for example, David is also working on expressing more interesting kind of computations like probabilistic computations on this, uh, this uh, subset. And we're kind of taking the low hanging fruit now and like this is faster than uh, Spark and these kind of things because of the incremental computation. So there's an efficiency gain and there is a, a flexibility gain, the same gain that Datomic provides or wants to provide to customers. Um, and there is uh, this reactiveness that you get for free. So this is kind of- Yeah, yeah that, that makes sense, I guess. Thank you. Um, I guess if anyone else has a question, we can do one more question. Otherwise, uh... <laughs> okay. Otherwise, give another round of applause for Nicholas. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.